Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Nancy, and I'm so happy to be with you today. And if you're in the room, welcome on this rainy Sunday. And if you're gathering with us online, a big welcome to you too. You know, breakfast is my favorite meal to eat out. But I always face a crucial dilemma because I don't know what to order. I don't know whether to get the savory egg bacon type dish or the sweet pancake French toast deal. So when I go out with my daughters, this is how we solve that. We each order one or the other of that, and we do the splitteroo thing. However, sometimes we like one of them better than the other, and then that leads to fighting. But I love, <laughs> love, love, love going out to breakfast. And if you meet a friend for breakfast, let's say you haven't connected in a while, you're probably looking forward to reconnecting with that person. But what if there's distance between you and your friend? What if you know that you've hurt that person in some way, or maybe they have hurt you? Maybe there's some awkwardness or even anger or resentment between you. So then how would you feel leading into that breakfast? Would you still be looking forward to it, or would you be like me and have kind of a stomach ache, not even able to digest until you clear things up with that person? Well, today we're going to look at one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible, and it describes a remarkable breakfast that Jesus had with his friends. And this chapter is full of drama and power and hope and grace, and there's something in this for both of us, all of us here today. As we dig in, I want to ask you to imagine that Jesus invited you for breakfast. What would that be like? How would it feel? What would be said between you? Most importantly, what might Jesus want to communicate to you as you linger over coffee or tea? So I invite you to grab a Bible. If you're in the room today, it's under the seat in front of you. And if you're at home, please grab a Bible. And we're going to look at uh, John chapter 21. This is found on page 881 in the Soul City Bibles. Now, I want to warn you, we are going to go through a lot of Scripture today. Are you with me? Can you do this? Yes, yes I know you can. Okay. Um, this, if this story were a movie, it would be um, two primary scenes. There would be a part one and a part two to the movie, or maybe a sequel. And there would also need to be a backstory. Two flashback scenes would need to be a part in order to understand the context of what's happening here and the significance of this breakfast. So let's start. We're going to read scene one first. All right, here we go. John 21, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. There is a whole lot going on here. Let's establish some context. There were seven of the disciples listed as being present in this moment, and it's been about 10 days since the resurrection. This isn't the first time they've seen Jesus. It's the third time as a group. And we can imagine, I think about this often, what was it like for the disciples post-crucifixion, post-resurrection? I imagine them being very disoriented, a little numb, 
and confused. They hadn't yet been assigned to go out and tell people about the resurrection, so they're sort of stuck in the land between. But likely, none of them was as emotionally low as Peter. Why is that? Well, because he was living with the truth that he had denied Jesus three times. Not once, not twice, three times. How do you feel when you've betrayed a friend? Someone that you deeply love. I imagine Peter wanted a do-over. He was probably struggling to sleep. He was tormented by the idea that he no longer had purpose, wondering if he had completely disqualified himself from the kingdom movement. And Jesus knows exactly how Peter feels. He sees his shame. And before leaving this earth for heaven, I think this is so important, before leaving the earth, Jesus wanted to make it right with Peter. He wanted to extend love and grace to him. The other disciples are minor players in this scene of forgiveness. The entire encounter was specifically staged by Jesus for Peter. So it's in that early morning dawn when it's first giving way to early light. And Jesus is standing on the shore, but at first the disciples don't know who it is. They probably think it's a stranger waiting to see if they can buy some fish. Jesus lovingly calls out to them, referring to them as his friends. And he asks, have you caught anything for food? Okay, now it's time for flashback number one. We're going to go back to a scene three years prior. This is found in Luke chapter 5. You don't have to go there right now. But Jesus was sitting in Peter's boat, and he was doing some teaching. This was very early on in Jesus' ministry, and at that point, Peter was called Simon. That was his given name. And he was just beginning to learn about this radical new teacher named Jesus who taught like no one else. Well, the fishermen had come up empty after a whole night on the water. Sound familiar? And at daylight, Jesus instructed Peter to put out into deeper water and let down the nets. Writer Ken Geyer imagines Peter thinking about it this way. Lord, no offense, but every fisherman knows that if you're going to catch fish, it's going to be at night when they rise from the depths to feed on the surface. And every fisherman knows that when the sun comes up, It drives them down below the nets. But Peter respects Jesus too much to say those words. That's what he's thinking. Instead, he obeys and he says, but because you said so, I will lay down the nets. Because you said so. Are we ready to say that to Jesus? You know, sometimes he asks us to do something that's really hard or might seem a little crazy. Am I willing to do it just because he says so? How about you? Are you willing to be a because you said so kind of believer? Instructs us sometimes to serve someone when it's not convenient or maybe initiate a conversation of reconciliation with someone. And are we willing in that moment to become more generous, to give of our time and our resources and to say, Jesus, because you said so? Well, Peter must have felt a little foolish back three years prior in that moment following the instructions from Jesus until he felt a tug, right? And soon the nets were just rocking with so many fish jumping and the nets tore. Peter called James and John to come help and the boats began to sink with the massive number of fish. This was the defining moment for Peter. Remember, he's new to Jesus at this moment. And he gets to the shore, and Jesus tells him, from now on, you're going to fish for people, not for fish. And Peter abandoned his boats, and he kneeled down in front of Jesus, and he humbled himself. And Jesus said those two words, follow me. So now, it's three and a half years later. Through the long night of fishing, don't you just imagine, as I do, the disciples reminiscing? Okay, we've been here before. Another night of no fish. Remember that time Jesus came through for us? Boy, that was really cool. Sure wish that could happen again. And then the man on shore calls out to them and instructs them in the emerging daylight to put out their nets. Deja vu. And once again, they were overwhelmed with fish. And John is the first one to recognize that it's actually Jesus on the shore. Peter, always the zealous, impulsive enthusiast, surely a seven on the Enneagram, throws on his coat and he goes to shore, walks to shore through the water, even though it's only a hundred yards. I picture Jesus with a huge smile on his face. Yep, that's Peter. 
here he comes. The rest of the men who are more practical stay in the boat. And when they get to shore, all of them are likely wet and cold and hungry. And what do they find? Jesus was cooking breakfast, capital letters. My friend Nancy Orbrick says this is the most stunning thing about the whole chapter because we learn right here that Jesus cooked. When you're wondering, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Jesus cooked, okay, people? He's a grill master. So he's already grilling some fish over the fire. And I have so many questions about this moment. Where did he get the fish and the bread? Did he stop at the store? Did he go fishing before they got there? Did he catch them on his own or did he just snap his fingers? I want to know, but we are not told. We just know he was cooking breakfast. And my friends, it's such a tender, loving scene. Jesus urged them to bring some of the fresh fish and add it to the fire. And as Peter helped to drag the nets to shore, someone counted the fish. John, who made this record for us, tells us there were 153. And Jesus says to the group with kindness and warmth, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. I wonder about the conversation over food. Did they laugh together about once again Jesus rescuing them in, in daylight, catching so many fish? But what about Peter, as everyone was joking around and laughing? Do you think he felt a little awkward? Do you think he wondered if Jesus might talk to him directly? So to prepare for scene two, which is the dialogue after breakfast, we need one more flashback. This flashback takes us to Luke chapter 22 at the Last Supper, and most of you know this story. Jesus told his disciples over that supper, he said, one of you is going to betray me. And in that moment, Peter, again the zealot, boldly declares, Lord, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go to prison for you. I'll do anything. Can't you just see him pumping his chest? I'm there for you, Jesus. And Jesus looked right at Peter, and he said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. Well, later in the night, when the soldiers arrested Jesus, Peter pulls his sword and cuts off the ear of one of the enemy. And let's give Peter credit that while most of the disciples fled, he actually followed at a distance. He wanted to see how Jesus was going to handle the religious leaders in the courtyard. So Peter followed them. And before dawn, he's sitting there warming himself by the fire, trying to plan his next move. And a servant girl spoke out, saying, this man was with him. And Peter said, I don't know him. Three times someone said, aren't you one of his followers? Weren't you with that group? I don't know him. I don't know him. So much for being ready to die for Jesus. Peter won't even admit that he knew him. And then... The sound of a rooster pierced the night just as Jesus predicted. And in that moment, Jesus locked eyes with Peter across the courtyard. What kind of look was it? I don't think it was an I told you so look. I think it was the look of a friend, loving and very sad. And Peter stumbled out of the courtyard. He's broken. He's overcome with extreme sorrow. And scripture says he wept bitterly. How he must have wished he could have a do-over, that he could turn back the night, that he could have a second chance to be the courageous man that he really and truly longed to be. Have you experienced the pain of a broken relationship? I know what it feels like to betray and be betrayed by a friend. This was several years ago, and I recall how much I wanted a do-over. I recall sleepless nights, tossing and turning, wondering, how can I make this right? I remember finally falling asleep sometimes, and then in the next morning when you woke up, there was that sickening feeling as you come to consciousness, oh, I've still got this heavy, heavy weight. I knew I needed to have a difficult conversation. When we go through a time of failure, life holds no joy, right? You just walking around with that burden until you do your part. And in this case, I needed to pursue peace. I finally initiated that conversation, and while it was extremely difficult, it built a bridge toward reconciliation. Ever since Peter had denied knowing Jesus, he felt the weight of that failure. Can't you feel for him? He knew that in the moment of testing, he had betrayed his friend. 
And I imagine him wondering if he could ever be forgiven. Doubting he would be the rock. Remember Jesus said, you're going to be the rock on which I'm going to build my church. Peter probably thought, I'm not even a pebble. I'm nothing. He thought all those plans were now dead, that his only option was to be a fisherman again, and he wasn't even very good at that, unless Jesus performed a miracle. So Jesus waits until everyone is done eating to initiate the most healing of conversations with Peter. So now we're ready for scene two, the love of the Savior for this enthusiastic, burly fisherman. Let's read what happens. We're going to start back up in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I don't know if this conversation here took place in front of the whole group. I kind of imagine Jesus pulling Peter aside after the meal. But John was likely right there because he's the one who recorded this conversation. I want to make a few observations about this scene and then read you a beautiful description of it by one of my favorite writers. First, notice that Jesus calls Peter by his given name, Simon, son of John. I think that's to remind him of where he came from and that he knew him back then. And the first time he asks Peter, do you love me more than these? And it's not clear what more than these means. It could be more than your friends, James and John, or your brother Andrew. Or it could mean more than the fishing profession and all the boats and the the joy that you get as a fisherman. The third time Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, there's a little twist in the Greek word used for love, and it's as though Jesus was asking Peter, are you even my friend? Are you even my friend? And Scripture tells us that Peter was hurt by being asked the third time. I don't usually read a longer excerpt from a book, but I really wanted to share this with you. It comes from Ken Geyer's book, Intimate Moments with the Savior, and this is his take on that situation. After the meal, Jesus takes Peter aside. What he says is remarkable. What he doesn't say is even more so. He doesn't say, some friend you turned out to be. I'm really disappointed in you. You let me down. You're all talk, coward. Boy, was I ever wrong about you. And you call yourself a disciple? Instead, he asks simply, do you love me? Not once, but three times. Once for each denial. Not to rub it in, but to give Peter an opportunity to openly confess his love. By the third time Peter asks him, Peter gets the connection. But Jesus is not there to inflict pain. He is there to relieve it. Jesus had seen his bitter tears when the rooster crowed. That was all he needed to see. That was repentance enough. Peter looks up, longing for the faintest glimmer of forgiveness. And in a language beyond words, in a language of love, it flows from the Savior's eyes. Feed my sheep, Peter. Jesus' way of saying, I still believe in you. I still think you're the right man for the job. And with the words, follow me, the restoration is complete. The painful memory is healed. Three and a half years ago, Jesus asked Peter to follow him. The offer still stands, despite Peter's failure. Jesus had orchestrated everything to bring back two memories to Peter's mind, a precious memory and a painful one. The painful one he brought back not to rebuke Peter, but to restore him. He didn't want to make him grovel in the dirt. He didn't want to show him how right he was and how wrong Peter was. He brought it to the surface for one purpose and one purpose only, to heal it. To heal it so Peter could go on loving him and serving him without the painful memory leaning over his shoulder the rest of his life, wagging an accusatory finger. That intimate moment proved to be a turning point in Peter's life. Within seven weeks, he would preach the boldest sermon of his life. It would be in Jerusalem, the very bastion of hatred against Jesus. 3,000 would be saved. They would form the nucleus of the church he would establish there. 
What a beautiful scene. Jesus is in the restoration business. He not only gave Peter forgiveness, he gave him a vision for his future. And I think we get a vivid picture here of what genuine love involves. It's more than just words or feelings. The evidence of our love will be in our actions. Now, you know this to be true. When you love someone, there's nothing passive about it. Think about a person who you deeply love, someone in your inner circle, like one of the top two or three people in your little inner circle. If that person calls with a need in the middle of the night, I bet you're right there. You might even help that person move. Ugh. <laughs> or pick them up at the airport. That's even worse. Both are signs of love. And when we love someone, we choose to sacrifice for that person. So Peter tells, or Jesus tells Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep, lead my people, serve them, and love them with all your heart. Now Jesus also indicates that this love won't come cheap, and there's a tremendous cost, and we just need to pick up at verse 18 what the cost is going to be for Peter. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This uh, indicates that Jesus is predicting that Peter will die by crucifixion. Church tradition tells us that when they were putting Peter on the cross, he begged to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to die in the same manner as his Lord had. He didn't feel that he was worthy of that. And the climax of the story is found in two simple words, follow me. The same two words Jesus told him three years prior. Loving Jesus means following Jesus. They go hand in hand. And here's why I love this story so much. It reveals the eager desire of Jesus to release and restore us so that, so that, there's a big so that, he can relaunch us into ministry, relaunch us into serving him. Don't you see how much Jesus wanted Peter to be free of the weight of his sin and failures? He staged this whole scene. And Jesus intended to clean up everything between him, them, to let Peter know that you are completely, absolutely, unconditionally forgiven and I will not even remember your betrayal anymore. I'm never going to say, oh, yeah, Peter, remember that time? You really let me down? It is over. It is done. And he's reminding him that he still has an assignment from God. I still believe in you, Peter. I want to launch you back into the work that I've called you to do. This encounter with Jesus, I think, reveals a pattern that you and I can follow. Here's what it looks like. A bunch of our words, okay? We start with regret, um, this is when we're sorry about something that we've done. Some people use this to kind of review the previous day and think, what do I regret from yesterday? What were some words I spoke that I regret? Or what were some opportunities to show love where I chose to be selfish instead? And so you think through your day and you have regret that leads to repentance. That's simply a broken spirit that says, Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I feel bad. I, I did not follow you the way I wanted to. And so that gives you a sense then of forgiveness, which leads to release, freedom. You bring it into the light, you confess it, and then you get freedom, release, and restoration. Your relationship is clean again. This happens with humans, right? When you're not doing well with some, another person, you have to make it right. You have to say, I'm sorry. And then it's restored, and that's what can happen with us and Jesus as well. And then he relaunches us. He relaunches us. He says, get back up again. I forgive you. Now get out there. We come to him on a regular basis, and we just admit where we have failed him. And then we can go from there. And he will give us assignments to show us that he still believes in us. And sometimes those assignments are very small, I remember a couple weeks ago, I came to Soul City on a Sunday morning by myself. I know some of you walk in here alone quite often, and I was by myself. 
And uh, often I can just be selfish and just come in and leave and that's it. But on this particular Sunday as I was driving in, I prayed, God, would you help me notice if there's anyone here that I could encourage or talk to? If you have anything for me, I'll just try to pay attention instead of being so focused on myself. So I was a little early and I was hanging out before the nine o'clock uh, in the lobby where there's some tall tables, you know those, and I was just sitting there by myself. And a young woman walked by who I had not seen in many, many months. And we reconnected. We had time to talk. She told me about some of the really serious challenges in her life these days. Now, you might call that coincidence. I call it at least divine coincidence. You know, I think it was an assignment. I think Jesus saw me, and I think he saw her. And I think there was some timing involved. And he launched me into a moment of love, for which I was so grateful so my question for you today is simply this. If you were sitting at breakfast with Jesus, just you and Jesus, first of all, is there anything you'd like to clean up? Is there something you need to own or confess and say you're sorry for? Where you look back and think, I'm still feeling some guilt and shame about that part of my story. I need to be forgiven and be released from this. And then if Jesus looked you in the eye and said your name, said Kevin or Julie or Mark, and the next question was, do you love me? Said your name and then said, do you love me? If you said, Lord, you know that I love you, what would he say next? If he said, follow me, what would that mean for you today? Now, some of you may say, you know what, I'm not quite ready to say I love you back. Maybe you're just exploring the faith then be honest. And if Jesus says, do you love me? You can say, I'm working on it. And I want you to help me to love you, to grow to love you. And then when he says, follow me, and some of you have walked with Jesus for a long time. When he says, follow me, what does that mean for you today, right now? Does he have an assignment for you? Maybe he's going to nudge you to make right a, a human relationship from which you are estranged, to be the bigger person to take the initiative to make that call or send that text and say, hey, can we talk? Maybe he will nudge you towards greater generosity. Maybe he will say, you know what, it's time for you to work on this addiction that you have that's keeping you from flourishing. It's time for you to ask for help. Or maybe he's going to ask you to sacrifice some of your resources or your gifts to make a difference for him in your neighborhood or your family or here at the church. All your job is to say, Jesus, I'm open. I'm available. And I'm stunned, actually, that you have assignments for me. That there might be some way that I could express my love for you and serve you. So I'm going to invite you. We're going to have a, a guided prayer time for just a moment. A little bit of space. A little bit of quiet. If you're new to this, it's okay. Just bow your heads for a moment, and I'll walk you through it. Okay? The first step is saying, is there anything you need to clean up with Jesus? Think about the previous day or week, anything you said or did that you regret or are sorry for. Maybe you got easily irritated with someone you claim to love or whatever it might be. Whatever comes to your mind, just own it. Just say, Jesus, you saw this, but I want you to know that I'm sorry. I want you to ask for your forgiveness. So go ahead and do some cleanup work with Jesus. And then if Jesus says your name and then says, do you love me? Some of you might respond that you're working on it that you're open, that you want to love him. And others of you would say, oh, I do love you, Jesus. You know that I love you. And then he might say, follow me. What do those two words mean to you today? In what way could you follow him today? Is there anything that comes to your mind that might be an assignment for you? Say, I will do it, Jesus, because you said so. Because you said so, I will do it. Jesus, 
We believe that when Peter looked in your eyes that day at breakfast, he saw love and mercy and compassion. He saw that you believed in him. He experienced the breathtaking goodness that comes from you, the love that can't be compared to any other kind of love. And God, help us all today to experience that same kind of love from Jesus, to be blown away by how merciful and kind and forgiving you are, to let it go because you have released it and you have forgiven us. Help us to forgive ourselves, to let it go, God, and to get right back up and get launched again into whatever assignments you have for us so that we can show some goodness and love and care in this world, in this broken world, in our own little part of it, in our families, in our neighborhoods, where we work. God, may we accept your assignments, however small they may be or however difficult they may seem. May we choose to follow you. How great is the love you show to us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. You have lavished your love upon us. Your kindness and goodness are breathtaking. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. My name is Brandon and I'm the Transformation Pastor here. Our hope is that this message encouraged you. And if it did, don't forget to share this link with a friend. Also, hit that subscribe button so you never miss a video and so that you can become a part of our global church online. And for more information about who we are or for giving information, feel free to visit our website. You'll see a link down below. And I hope is that we'll see you back soon.